I'm afraid I will trust in you. When I can go on, I'll rely on you. Though the mountains quake and the earth gives way, I'll hold fast to you, my hope and stay. Because Jesus, you alone are my firm foundation. All the ground is sinking sand. Jesus, you're the rock, my life is built secure on. Oh, I am held by your strong hand. When the stormy tides begin to overtake me, I'll reach my hand to yours alone. I'll be assured of Christ, He is my anchor. I'll trust He'll safely lead me home. Jesus, You alone are my firm foundation. All other ground is sinking sand. Jesus, You're the rock, my life is built secure home. Oh, I am held by your strong hand. And when the flowing tides of mercy come, subdue me. Humbly I'll bow before your throne. In grace's waters I'll swim ever freely. My soul will rest in you alone. Jesus, you alone are my firm foundation. All other ground is sinking sand. Jesus, you're the rock, my life is built secure home. Oh, I am held by your strong hand. Oh, I am held by your strong hand. Oh, I am held by your strong hand. So, uh, Matt, I hope, I hope I'm not about to get in trouble with you. Uh, but I, church family, I want you to know that Matt Presley wrote that song. And uh, I have been looking forward to hearing it, and yeah. and I cannot wait uh, to hear our church family sing it sometime soon as a corporate worship song. So anyway, thank you, Matt, for that. I praise the Lord for that song. been very eager to hear that one. So uh, It's good to see you this morning. I want you to take your Bible, And I want you to turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. Our text this morning is Galatians 3, verses 23 through 29. So go ahead and find your way there. Uh, And once you get there, go ahead and take your worship folder that you received on your way in. I want you to take our Connect card out. Guests, if this is your first time with us, thank you so much for joining us in worship. And we want to get to know you. So would you please put your information on this Connect card. And then for everybody on the other side of it, Uh, We would love to know how we can pray for you and your family. It is very helpful uh, for you to keep us aware of of needs in your family, certain prayer requests, and specific ways to pray. So please consider putting some prayer needs on this, and you can leave it in your seat on your way out, or as you go through the lobby, you can put it in the offering baskets, uh, and we appreciate your help with that. Let me also just mention a couple things in our bulletin announcements. Uh, Trunk or treat is coming up. We need cars. We need candy, so please consider providing both of those. I also want to remind the church family that next Wednesday, uh, on October 19th, we as a church family are invited to the Celebrate Recovery Anniversary Celebration. Uh, They're celebrating their eight-year anniversary. It'll be a special night. There's a lot of accomplishments being celebrated that night for those who've been going through the ministry, and we are all invited. So I would ask you really to consider going uh, to that and celebrating with those who've been ministered to and celebrate recovery. Let me also say, uh, you may know someone that needs that ministry. 
If you struggle with anxiety, if you struggle with addiction, if you struggle with uh, shame, holding on to some sort of resentment, any kind of, they refer to them as hurts, habits, or hang-ups. That's a broad category. Uh, They do powerful ministry there. If you or someone you know needs that type of gospel ministry encouragement, please learn more about Celebrate Recovery. Let me also mention uh, again that we are trying to provide for a baby shower for Asiya. Uh, who is a young lady with our Afghanistan family that we've been sponsoring. There is a box uh, on our way to the offices next to the We Care box. So just come, deliver something for We Care, deliver something for the baby shower. We appreciate your help with that. Let me also mention one final thing uh, that is not in our announcements. I want to let you know uh, that starting next Sunday, uh, let me kind of provide a little context. I'm going to just let you know next Sunday, Uh, We intend to bring back passing the offering plates for our worship time. It's something that for COVID we we withheld from all this time. And uh, so we're bringing that back next Sunday. So we wanted you to be aware of that. Let me also tell you uh, that this was something that the elders discussed and the deacon leadership team discussed. We put some thought into this. It was an opportunity to think through why do we do this this way and and what is it about. And, And we have concluded that it is a good time. It is a good opportunity for putting an element of worship into our corporate gathering. Uh, and so uh, it's a thoughtful thing that we put prayer into and discussion, and we're glad to be bringing it back. And it kind of feels like, you know what, it's sort of the last thing that we needed to bring back that, that COVID seemed to kind of uh, frustrate. And so it's also a, a good opportunity for us to remember God was faithful uh, through really a challenging two and a half years that, that we have had as a world. So we just wanted you aware of that. Let me say something to deacons in here. If you're a deacon, we want to ask you to touch base with Mac Goodwin. Uh, he's going to be overseeing, signing up for guys who can help with the plates, uh, guys who can do the offering prayer as an element of our worship service. And so if you're a deacon, uh, connect with Mac Goodwin, and uh, we want to get his leadership and start to orchestrate who will be involved in what during each service. Let me go ahead now. I want to read our text. I'm going to read it in full. Then I want us to pray and ask God to help us hear from his word. Galatians chapter 3, beginning of verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us here this morning. God, I thank you for the Bible. Lord, I believe that you have been growing across this church family, growing a hunger for your word. I thank you for that. I pray that that hunger never, never gets content. Lord, even when you satisfy our hunger, you do so in a way where we want more. We look forward to the next meal. And I I pray that you will always grow our hunger for your word. It is the bread of life. We do not live on bread alone. We live on every word that comes from your mouth. So now I ask that we do not take for granted, that we do not take lightly what it means that we can open up Scripture, that we believe, we are convinced that this is the Word, the living Word of the living God, the one true God, that you are speaking to us as your people through your Word. And Lord, I, I know that I, it doesn't even land on me like it should. But Lord, I pray that we will grow in our appreciation to know that you have gathered us into your presence to speak to us 
So Holy Spirit, speak now by your grace and mercifully will you speak. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to be clear on two things this morning from this text. I want us to be clear on what the law was. And I want us to be clear on who we are. All right, so let's be clear on what the law was from verse 23 through 25. Then I want us to be clear on who we are from verses 26 through 29. So let's be clear on what the law was. Verse 23, we see that the law was first our guard. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law. Held captive under the law. We discussed this last week. The law was our guard, so to speak. Paul says we were held captive under the law. Then he even says, we or explains, we were imprisoned. The law was our guard. The law served to show us that we are all, no exceptions, we are all guilty as charged in our sin. As a reminder, what did the law do? Helped us identify our sin. It magnified our sin. In other words, it showed us what sin was. And then it showed us how much sin we commit. And then it also provided ways for our sin to be rectified. To be men that is not permanently resolved or atoned for. That had to wait for the Christ. But the law served to provide the, the offerings and the sacrifices and the regulations just to manage things so, according to God's mercy, sin would not get out of control. The law was our guard. Now, I want you to notice a very important word in verse 23. Imprisoned until. So, I have good news for you. The guilty as charged conviction did not receive a life sentence. The law didn't have a permanent role. It had a temporary role we were imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So the law was our guard until a revelation of faith would come. So what we see is not only was the law our guard, but in verse 24 we'll see that it also was our guardian. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. It wasn't just a guard, it wasn't just a corrections officer, it was, it was a guardian. It has a different connotation to it. What Paul is referring to was a formal role often used in their culture. Usually assigned to a servant or a slave, someone very much inferior to the father in the family. But the role of the servant guardian, it, the word that Paul uses is where we get the word uh, pedagogy. The role of the guardian was to help raise up, rear the child until he came of age. So it's a compound word that refers to a young boy and a leader. It's, it's a leader of the young son. And, and the, the guardian would make sure that the child uh, got to school and back okay. It would make sure the child uh, practiced hygiene. You know, there's one, the guardian was one that says, time to take a nap, time to get a bath. Uh, made sure that the manners were being learned. All of that, that was the role that the guardian played. Now, the guardian, again, did not have the authority of the father. It was an assistance to the father. Raising this child until he came of age. Paul says, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came. Think of it in terms of a playground. So, so when I'm at work, I can hear often that the kids from the Child Development Center, they go over to the playground over here at the corner of our office building. So the kids can go in there. Let me ask you, do they, do they have a freedom at the playground? Yeah, they have a certain kind of freedom. They have an age-appropriate freedom. They can kind of run around. They can even run them up to a degree in the playground. But there's a fence. They can't go outside that fence. That fence is gated shut. There are teachers, there are guardians there keeping watch over the kids so that they can enjoy an age-appropriate freedom. That's what the law did for us. The law kept God's people in the playground, so to speak, 
Look at that word again, comes up in verse 24. So the, the law was our guardian until. The law kept God's people in the playground until something else came along. In other words, the people were not kept in the playground forever. Can you imagine those kids in the playground over there just growing up and being adults still playing in the playground? Something kind of like that happened this week. Walked out into the hallway, found myself getting challenged to a race. Actually, I think I'm the one that did the challenging. Nikki Handel and I, you may not know this, two and a half years ago, Nikki Handel and I had a race. Right there in that missions hall, the long hallway, we put it to dignified use. We, we raced one another. It was caught on video and everything. I won, just so you know. <laughs> two and a half years ago, I was, I was old then doing that. We found ourselves feeling a little competitive. So, fine, let's go race over there. So we actually go over there and race. And Melanie Butler, the director of our children's development center, she heard about it. She wanted in on that. Three of us racing. Nikki Hanlon took home the bronze. I took home the silver. Now, I, I need to let you know I did give them a healthy head start. I would also like the record to reflect that the, the original race track was longer. We shortened it. And I do think that the video shows that Nikki kind of got in my way. I might have been able to catch Melanie if it weren't for Nikki getting in my way. And then later that day, I'm brewing a cup of coffee. And I'm just thinking, the average age on that racetrack was about 44 when I was a kid, I could not imagine my dad at 44 years of age racing his colleagues down the hallway. How ridiculous that thought is. And we're fortunate we didn't injure ourselves. Now think of how ridiculous it would be if you rolled up to the church on a Thursday afternoon and you saw the church staff playing in the playground. Matt and Kyle pushing one another on the swing set. Debbie and Ginger on a seesaw. Nikki putting dirt on her hair. It's ridiculous. We have to come of age. But if you are still relying on works of the law, then that is a picture of you in terms of the gospel. We are to realize that the law served a temporary purpose until Christ came. He said, you can, you can come out of the fenced-in area now. He's provided freedom in the gospel. The law was our guard and our guardian until Christ came, and Paul explains at the end of verse 23, 24, in order that we might be justified by faith. For those of you who have, who have been here for the last several weeks, I hope you're familiar with that phrase. In case you are new, maybe new to Christianity, maybe not even aware of what the gospel is, I want you to understand what this means. Justification by faith is the idea that before a holy, righteous God, we who are sinners, all of us who fall short of God's glory, we can be declared right before a holy, righteous God, not because we're good enough, but because we must by faith receive who Jesus is as the Son of God and as all man who took our place on the cross and when he died and rose from the grave, he provided eternal life for us. We are declared right. We are justified by faith, by believing that Jesus is who the, God, the Bible says he is and that he did what the Bible said he did by declaring that he is Lord, that he is risen from the grave that's what the law led us to. To the point where we realize God sent his Savior. Next week we'll see that it was in the fullness of time that he came. So that's what the law was. It was a guard. It was a guardian until Christ came. Now, I want us to talk in a moment about who we are. But before we get to there, I want you to see a powerful point in this text that takes place when we go from verse 25 to verse 26. And verse 25 says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. 
For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. I don't know if you noticed, there's a bit of a transition there. It's the word we turning into the word you. In verse 25, we are no longer under a guardian. In verse 26, you are all sons of God. If you notice, verses 23 through 25, we were held captive. The law was our guardian. We might be justified. We are no longer under a guardian. Then it shifts. Now Paul talks more directly to the Galatians. It seems you are all sons of God. You were baptized, so on, so forth. I hear an intentional transition. Remember, these Galatians were Gentiles, non-Jews, and they had some Jews referred to as Judaizers telling them, if you really want to be a follower of Christ, then you also have to follow the law. In particular, by being circumcised, you have to obey the law if you really want to follow Christ. In other words, you have to become more Jewish if you really want to be a Christian. And Paul is battling that false theology. He's saying, absolutely not. He says, that's a false gospel. We even see it in this transition. He's saying, we, we the the Jews, most directly. The truth applies to all of us. We are all held captive by our sin. But hear it as the Galatians. Paul is clarifying, we Jews were held under the law. We were held captive We were imprisoned, but only for a certain period of time. What changed? Christ came, and you, non-Jews, you now are also sons of God. So when salvation was provided for the whole world, there was a freedom that the people of God experienced, that they were able to walk into as well. If you think about the Jews who had the covenant of circumcision, God gave them circumcision. What is circumcision? Well, among other things, it is a sacrifice of flesh and a shedding of blood. So God's chosen people had to sacrifice their flesh and shed their blood until the Christ came. The Judaizers were telling Galatians, you have to be sacrificed in order to really be a part of the people of God. No, the gospel says we, we were circumcised so that you don't have to be. Even in circumcision, you see a substitute atonement being displayed, a sacrifice of flesh, a shedding of blood. It was a gospel picture anticipating the fullness of time when the Christ would come, sacrifice his flesh, and shed his blood so that we could be justified by faith. So we are no longer under a guardian, Paul says, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Let's be clear on who we are. We are sons. He explains why. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we are sons, we are sons of God because we have put on Christ who is the Son of God through baptism. He says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, what's really going on? Well, then it's a demonstration, a display that you have put on Christ. So in our 11 o'clock service, we're scheduled to baptize two young ladies, and those young ladies will go right up here to the baptistry. They will be led all the way under the water as a picture of burial with Christ, identifying with the death of Christ, which was sufficient to pay for our sins. They will come out of the water as a picture of the new eternal life, the resurrection and the life that we celebrate celebrate in Christ. They will walk up the steps sopping wet, and then they will put on dry clothes. They will put on new clothes. Even that part of the baptism experience helps us understand you are now putting on Christ. You are clothing yourself with Christ, identifying Him by faith, identifying with Him by faith. Essentially, by faith, we realize we are becoming in Christ, new creations. That's why Paul could say, just look back in chapter 2, verse 20, 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is essentially what someone being baptized is showing in picture form. That we no longer live. We've been clothed with Christ. The life that we live, we live in Christ. We are sons For we have put on Christ through baptism, and then the word therefore does not show up in our text, but we we can kind of place it in there. There's a therefore sort of in in spiritual parentheses before verse 28. He says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we are sons, for we have put on Christ, therefore we are all one in Christ. There is a unity that the gospel proclaims that would have been received like fresh water for the Galatians. The gospel is telling them, you belong in the family of God. They had people say, no, not until you get circumcised, not until you're Jewish enough. Paul says, in faith in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. We do not understand how seismic that statement would have been. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Wouldn't have made sense for so many people based on how they identified as God's people. Now the gospel comes in to show, no, no, there's not a permanent division between Jew and non-Jew. No, the Jews were called as God's people. And part of the reason is so that the gospel would be claimed to all the nations of the earth. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Even in the Old Testament, a non-Jew, if they wanted to become a part of the people of God, a a non-Jewish male could become circumcised. Paul says there's neither slave nor free, even a slave male could become circumcised and so they could become a little more, significant amount more part of the body of of the people of God and yet not quite fully and yet there's this barrier that, that couldn't be overcome that way. He says there's no male and female, quoting from Genesis 1, God made them in his image, he made them male and female in his image. He's saying even the gender division does not exclude anyone from being in Christ. I wondered, I tried tried to think of how, how good that must have sounded to women in the Galatian churches. You think, you talk about seismic. All the while this this covenant was, was stamped on all the males all these years. All the Jewish males know a Gentile woman is hearing, no, the gospel is for you too. It transcends that barrier. It transcends that division. So we are sons. And I want you to know that I'm I'm sticking with the translation sons for a reason. This word for sons, it could be Certainly given the idea of children or descendants, it is, it is all of that, but I want us to hear it in a way that's most effective, that, that Paul's proclaiming the power of the gospel to turn all of them, Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female, into the status of sonship before the Heavenly Father. You see, if we are sons, it means that we are heirs. Heirs. Verse 29. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, whether you are a slave or you are free, whether you are a man or a woman, you in Christ are an heir. You have the status of the firstborn son. We are heirs. He says we are Abraham's offspring according to promise. I want you to hear part of what Paul says. Try to hear it if you're a Galatian. Let's say you're a new 
Galatian follower of Christ, and yet your faith has been disturbed. Your faith has been troubled by someone saying, well, you're not really a follower of Christ yet. You have to be circumcised first. You have to become more Jewish in order to be really Christian. But hear what Paul said and try to hear it with their ears. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's. Oh, that would have been good news. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Do you remember this word offspring coming up before? Look, chapter 3, verse 16, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Do you remember his argument that does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ? So he's saying, look, the law is showing us we have someone to look forward to, Christ, who was promised before the, the law came. He is the offspring. And now he's telling us, if you are Christ, if you have put on Christ, if you are clothed with Christ through baptism, then you too are Abraham's offspring. I might have gotten some amens in the Galatians gatherings. To hear that good news. We are heirs according to promise. We are Abraham's offspring. Think back to Genesis. God gave Abram a promise of offspring. He promised him a son and he had to wait. So finally he said, well, all I got is this, this guy from Damascus, Eliezer. He's the closest thing that I have to an heir. God says, no, he's not going to be your heir. I'm going to give you a son. I've already promised you that. They had to wait. The next chapter, Sarah comes up with an idea. says, well, why don't you have a son through Hagar, my servant? So then they have Ishmael through Hagar. God has to say, no, that's, that's not the heir. I have promised you I'm going to give you a son. And then eventually Isaac was born. Isaac was the son, God refers to him as the son of promise. Now Paul is telling the Galatians, if you are in Christ, if your faith is in Christ, if you've been baptized in the name of Christ, that means you have put on Christ, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring according to promise. It's the gospel coming to fruition. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's. So that begs the question for them and for you. So are you Christ's? It's a question I want to leave you with. Are you Christ's? So really this text shows us not just who we are, but whose we are. Are you Christ's. I got to thinking about this promise that God gave Abram. One of the aspects of the promise back in Genesis 12, he tells Abram, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And I realize that that term family, it can have a somewhat broad connotation to it but I do want to use that word to land the plane this morning I want us to think about the families in here I want you to think about your family everybody wants their family to be blessed but we have to make sure we understand the nature of the blessing I want your family to receive the blessing that only comes in Christ so dads, I want you in a moment to be ready just to personally be, be in prayer. Asking, letting God show you if your family is receiving the blessing that can only come through faith in Christ. Moms, I want you to ask that of yourself. What is this family being blessed by faith in Christ? Children, I want you to think of that. Is our family being blessed through faith in Christ. That's what I want to pray for right now. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. God, I pray that we, we tap into the promise from Genesis 12. 
from before the law came. The law had a temporary role, certain provisions, so that the promises would be fulfilled in Christ. God, you tell us in your word that if we are Christ, then we are Abraham's. And you told Abraham that through Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we know that that promise is fulfilled, is culminated in your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that every family represented in this worship center right now, that we would either be living in the blessing that you promised, or that today would be the day of salvation for those families. Moms and dads, let me in this prayer just speak to you. If you do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, then I plead with you to acknowledge your sin right now. In in your spirit, acknowledge your sin before a holy, righteous God and thank the Heavenly Father for sending His Son who sacrificed His flesh, who shed His blood to pay for that sin, who came out of the grave to show you what eternal, abundant life is all about. God, I pray. I pray that you would show us our need For your son. And that through him we too can become your sons, your heirs. We pray this in his name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Church, would you stand as we respond to the word this morning? Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art! Then sings my soul. Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art.
thou art. Before I read our benediction, I want to say, if you, if you heard the gospel in here this morning and maybe for the first time realized your need for Christ, maybe even as, as I prompted you in prayer, you confessed your sin to Christ, I want you to do something. I want you to tell somebody. If you were invited to church this morning, I want you to tell them. If you want to, if you want to call the church office this week, email us and say, I want to, I want to talk about the gospel. I, I, I received Christ, or I want to learn more about him. I want you to tell somebody. And we, encourage, we are excited. We would love to encourage you in your faith. Now for everybody, listen to the words of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.